Sönen Podcast With my daughter Lily In this episode Stop it, this is it's not me. at all relevant to the film It's the intro Uh huh Hi We've... everyone, welcome to the movie <laughs> podcast My name's Lily And my name's Daddy I'm gonna do a podcast We gotta redo that no. normally uh, in this episode, we're talking about Perks of Being a Wallflower from 2012, based on a book by the same name, which was written by Stephen Chbosky. Okay, yeah. As his name said. I'm not going to even try and do it, because well, I think he's... Well, I, one of us has to, who also wrote and directed this film. He hasn't directed much since. I think he's only directed two things since then: Wonder and Dear Evan. Oh, he directed Hansen. Wonder and Dear Evan Hansen. Yes. I didn't know that. They're both very good. Oh, I haven't seen them. I don't think. Wonder's very good. Apparently, he was um, influenced to write this um, based on a couple of his favourite films: Breakfast Club and Dead Poets Society, hmm. which I can see because they're both sort of school. Yeah. Teen based. So, what's the film about, or what the book and the film? Or just tell us so, what it's about. Okay, it's about uh, Charlie Kalakamekis. I, I could pronounce that last name wrong, but... Just say Charlie. Uh, okay, Charlie. And he's just started high school, and he's feeling quite uh, isolated and lonely. And he, he makes friends with a couple of high school seniors, and... Um, yeah, I mean... It's just the stories of his first year of high school. Like a coming of age teen type film. Yeah. Um, yeah, and obviously he has uh, issues. He suffers from depression, I'd say. Am I yeah, right? I think maybe PTSD as well and a lot of anxiety. Mm, obviously, we're going to talk spoilers. Yeah. Um, it turns out that his aunt, Helen, uh, Helen abused him. Yeah. Well, it's like inferred that or hinted that she maybe molested him or something. Yeah, but I think it's pretty much confirmed in the books, isn't it? Yeah, for mm. the most part. And it's implied enough in the film that you, you know, they don't say graphically, but yeah, that's what's happened. Yeah. Is when he I mean, was... you can get that from when mm. um, Sam was uh, and him were making out at the end of the film, and that's what triggers his flashback to his Aunt Helen, so you can kind of get that that's probably what sort of happened. Mm. So, good riddance to Helen. So then he starts at this high school and he makes friends with Patrick and Sam. Sam. There is, he makes other friends connected to them, but they're the two that he gravitates to the most. Yeah. Patrick, who's played by Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller, who's in The Flash. We need to talk about Kevin, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. We need to talk about The Flash, Fantastic Kevin and Where to Find Him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's had a lot go on. Interesting, yeah. man. Mm. So he's, he's, he is a likeable person in this. Yeah. Like Patrick. Yeah, I mean, Patrick's it's not perfect. Character. Yeah, no, it's really... I've, I really like Patrick's character. Yeah, I, I do. More so than I like, say, his character in We Need to Talk About Kevin. Well, no one likes his character in We Need to Talk About Kevin. So, a little bit about... I tried watching a documentary about Ezra Miller and... There's so much stuff. Eventually, I turn it off. I felt dirty. I had to go wash my armpits. Um, mm -hmm. Even from his first film, um, when he was, I think he was like 15, he had no problem smoking or um, doing the sex scenes because he'd already had sex and smoked at that young age. Apparently, he said that he was abused at 14. Mm -hmm. um, and I see there was an interview where he's talking about he was def because I think it was, it might have been an interview for We Need to Talk About Kevin, and he's basically defending every scumbag ever. He's saying that all humans have dualistic nature, which they do, but I think it comes to, you know, so we're like 70% good, 30% bad, or you might be 70% bad and 30% good, yeah. whatever. But obviously there are some people who are so scummy, the percentage is so much that I don't feel we should have sympathy for them. But he does. Anyway, I don't agree with that. Yeah, they are a terrible person. Mm. He was arrested for possession of drugs early on. Now, he was an activist as well. And he also was very vocal against uh, violence towards women. Which is quite ironic because he's been violent towards women 
he's got very physical with them. It's a video of him choking a fan or choking a girl who thought they was joking about it and he started trying to choke her out on the floor. Yeah, which... I, I don't, this is just, yeah, it's not nice. No, I know it's not, yeah, but no, it's you know, just... I'm just talking, you know, the elephant in the room. He, yeah, he was, comes across a bit pretentious. He wants like a polyamorous relationships all the time, which he can get away with because of his fame and stardom. So he yeah. can pick and choose and there'll be loads, of course there'll be loads of boys and girls who would, you know, they'd do really, oh, okay, yeah, I don't mind sharing you, but it's just sort of abusing his power. Yeah, Apparently he smells as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because that's what, well, you know, the thing to said in that documentary, saying that he smelt because he wasn't washing, he kept wearing the same clothes. And I know those kind of people because when I worked in the supermarket, there was sometimes customers like that and you could smell them from a mile off. Up from the next aisle, you go, mm. oh, God, yeah. someone's here again. And, you know, I feel sorry for some people who can't, but he's got no excuse. He can wash and apparently had long pointy toenails. Oh, God. Yeah, um, they are quite gross. Yeah. And his biggest problem, because he spent a lot of time, he was in Iceland, he spent a lot of time there abusing people in Hawaii, where there was a girl, Takata Iron Eyes, that it was reported like he sort of groomed her from a young age and just sort of took her everywhere with him and his her parents are trying to separate them but at the same time I was also thinking as a parent you've got to step in at one point early on it doesn't matter how famous the person is you've got to say no you're not coming near my daughter again so I'm not blaming the parents but they've got to take some responsibility it's too easy just to sort of blame one person he's clearly a, a mixed up person in the head and it's just got spiraled out of control because he's got people around him who are enabling him who are saying Oh yeah, whatever you say is true. And he just talks all this gibberish about being part of the earth and everything. And they were like, oh wow, you're so clever. So he's getting his smoke blown up his ass all the time. There was a famous emperor who was very popular. And he hired someone to walk behind him constantly saying, you're only human, you're only human. Because with all the adulation he was confronted with, he wanted to stay grounded. And I think sometimes some celebrities need that. And who, who what other actors in this film? Emma Watson, who was in Harry Potter, The Bling Ring, Beauty and the Beast. This was her first major non-Harry Potter film. Oh. Yeah. She plays Sam. You've got Logan Lerman, who's in Percy Jackson. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> That's not Percy, Percy Jackson. Jackson. Ooh. That's not Percy Jackson. Uh, Noah, Fury, and Ten Past Three to Yama. I know people call that Free Ten to Yama. But being that I'm English, 10 past three to Yama. Mm -hmm. Paul Rudd, who's in Ant Man, Anchor Man, I Love You Man. Man. Man, man. Man, man, man. He's Mr. Anderson Man. You've also got Dylan McDermott, uh, Johnny Simmons, who's young Neil in. Stop looking at my notes. Uh, I'll read to you. Look that way, please. Ben always used to do that, and I had to pull him up on it. He'd be like, oh. I'm going to surprise you with things. He was young Neil in Scott I Pilgrim. Knew this. I this. This was things I already knew. All right. What about the doctor at the end? Doctor at the end. Well, I didn't know that, did I? I was talking about the young Neil bit because I'm a big Scott Pilgrim fan. So okay. Do you know who the, who the doctor is at no. the end? No. Who is the doctor? Joan the Cusack. Oh, really? Yeah. Who, of course, is Jessie in Toy Story. That's why she kept saying to him, Say that again. Got Tom Savini. He's the uh, the teacher who Patrick sort of has a little to and fro with, the yes. one who calls him nothing. He's a very famous makeup artist. Like he does like monster make like for all the George A. Romero films, like the Living Dead stuff. But I know him best from Dust or Dawn, right. when he played Sex Machine, the one who had the gun on his groin. Uh, oh, oh God, yeah. Ugh, I I don't like that film. Well, I do. I know, I don't. But you like this film though, don't you? Yes, I do like this Why do you like this film so much? I don't know. I think, I mean, I can identify with a lot of like Charlie's anxiety, like myself. And I just, I know, I, I find the film really good. I think it's a good film. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I read it in the wrong order or watched it in the wrong order. I watched the film before I read the book, but I enjoy both. They're both very good. Yeah, I like the film because there's, I've seen a lot of these teen angst 
um, drama films and sometimes I find they're either too light-hearted or too depressing and this one seems to find a good balance like there's some emotional moments but it, you know it doesn't sort of drag on it too much like that mm. Kevin film well Kevin's different that's not a teen film that's a psychological thriller yeah, or whatever about a woman failing to pull her son in line if that's what you want to take from that film then go ahead but yeah but no in this one yeah it's, and I liked um the three main characters they were, yeah. they were all believable and good and I found that we had good chemistry together you know and they seem like a, I've, I've known sort of groups of people like that especially when I went to college you know yeah. it, it's a realistic sort of friend group there's none of them you think well he wouldn't be friends with him and no. she went and there's no sort of two extremes it's not like Hey, Poindexter, do our homework. Okay. And it's one with like big glasses doing their homework. No, it's, it's all And then there's the jock like, hey. It's all very believable characters. Like everyone's quite human in it. Even mm. if you don't spend ages on every single character, they don't, none of them feel quite, none of them feel two dimensional. Like no. They, they all feel human. Yeah. So. No, definitely. But I think that's where, um, because obviously this was a book first, and because of the fact that uh, Stephen Chbosky was the director of this film, he obviously would have had an idea of how these characters would be, and that's probably why it comes across so well in the film. Yeah, probably often with writing, you write what you know, and like whenever I've written stuff, mo loads of characters, I think, you know, the easiest thing to do is think of someone you actually know, yeah. or a combination of people you know who are quite similar, and you think, well, what would they, because then when you're writing the dialogue, you think, well, he or she would react this way. Yeah. Um, although I, I don't get how three random people have never heard of Heroes by David Bowie. The first well, time around I'm watching that like, and, and Heroes is playing and he's like, what's this song? I thought I was about to go, it's David Bowie. Have you never heard it before? But they were like, no, I don't know. I don't know. And you think, yeah, do you well, not I mean, know? You, yeah, but you, there's, that's happened to you before, like back before like phones and stuff were popular. You'd hear songs and then you'd be like, oh, what is this song? You've even told me about experiences like that and then you just find out later mm, on. So you I can't, suppose. you can't like, um, it, also they are American in this, so you can't, you've got to remember. Yeah, but David Bowie was big all around. David, uh, yeah, but this is like set in the 90s. I get that David Bowie was still popular then, but obviously it wouldn't necessarily have been. Mm, it's actually set the 1991 to 92 school year. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I suppose I can get that, but it's it's just weird that they would pick a what I've always thought of as like a very popular song to be this slightly obscure song that they're looking for. Like, oh, well, I mean, it would have made sense it. for. The, I get why they did. For example, because obviously originally it was meant to be a Fleetwood Mac song that was played during that scene, mm. according to the book. But I think it made more sense to have a song like Heroes playing in the background because it is it's such a moment that needs that sort of music. yeah it's more upbeat yeah what did you so you like the film as well i don't like the film i was able to watch it a second time which means i like it yeah i was originally going to wear a rocky horror costume yes but it, i couldn't find the corset uh rocky horror playing a big part in it yeah doesn't it when the um the patrick character sort of they perform rocky horror is it like weekly or something yes at this theatre where the film plays and they all perform it in front, which is uh, something which is done a lot with that particular film, Rocky Horror. And it's it's a film which is often seen as a um, a go to for that kind of collective of people, the the out the outcasts of society, you yeah. know, which they see themselves as they see themselves as being the odd crazy ones. It obviously speaks to a lot of people in that sense. Yes. Um. I felt loads of people slag off Emma Watson's American accent, and I always thought, well, well sounds all yeah. right to me. But then I suppose it's we're English, so maybe we wouldn't notice if it sounded off. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's the same as if you hear an um, American doing a British accent in a film. An American might not notice it, but it's obvious to someone who is British or is American. Yeah, I suppose that is true. Is you often get Americans doing what they think is an English accent, and it's uh, miles Half off, of it, but yeah. I have heard a lot worse English people doing American accents, but that one seemed okay to me. But yeah, maybe it's just where people know her so well as Hermione, 
Hermione. Uh, another thing I had issue with, I felt there was quite fickle of the friends at one point, was especially when there's he's a part where he's, he's dating that girl and then told to kiss the most beautiful girl in the room and he kisses Emma Watson's character. And yeah, that was a bit of a jerk move, but at the same time, things like that happen in friend groups and for them to sort of completely shun him in that way, I thought yeah. was a bit mean. You know, okay, give him a hard time, but for them to sort of go high and mighty, and, oh, we want nothing to do yet, I thought it was a bit scummy thing to do, especially because they knew what he'd gone through previously. Yeah, you'd, you'd they think... knew he had no, he didn't, he'd lost his friend and everything. Yeah. Again, it is it is sort of like different because obviously they'd all been friends longer. Than... I I agree that it was scummy to kick him out, but they'd all been friends a lot longer, and obviously because there was a history between um Sam and Sam. No, I know I knew Sam. I'm trying to think of the other Mary Elizabeth. Mm. Mary and set between Sam and Mary Elizabeth, but obviously. Yeah, but there's. That's no reason to sort of completely shun someone, say, oh, you know, he's apologised, he was saying sorry, sorry, and he was trying to apologise to him a lot, and you think some people, I think it's uh, it's quite realistic in a way, because there are some people who, as soon as they get the moral high ground an inch over anyone else, they will take it, and they'll run with it, go, don't talk to me, don't phone me again. I mean, like that, Mary, Mary Elizabeth, yeah, okay, embarrassing, but she did throw herself at him, and then decide mm -hmm. that one day, it's been one night, and all of a sudden, oh, I can't believe you're my boyfriend now. It's like... For my new boyfriend. Is yeah. he? Yeah. And especially the age difference as well between the characters. I know, what a nonce she is. I mean, all of them, it, is, it seems a bit questionable between all of them. I mean, granted, in the book, it is explained that he um, was held back a year. Mm. After, and I think it's after he. the... Who's he? Charlie. Right. I'm Charlie sure was that, held back a year. I'm pretty sure that's like inferred. People can get that from what yeah, I'm Yeah, but saying. Patrick, there's a bit where the, he says the bat Patrick. No, Patrick was doing freshman shop. You just got confused about that because you weren't paying attention. Mm. Huh? Hmm? Yeah. No, Charlie was held back a year in the books. I think it was because of the, it's been a while since I've read it. But because of his friend killing himself? Yes, because of his best friend killing himself, which, um, Hit, that means he is 16 in the film, while the other characters are 17 slash 18, I believe. Yeah, so he's sort of like... Uh, he's about year he's two a, years younger. He, I think he's like a year younger, but because of him being held back, he's school years, he's two years below them. Anyway. It still seems, uh, from without knowing that as a context thing, you, you, it would, you'd be questioning why all of the characters basically throw themselves onto him at different points within the film. Mm. Which is a bit strange. So you've read the book as well, though. Yes, I have read the book as well. Who are the letters to then? It, oh, I, from what I remember, it's this pen pal that he has, but it's like completely random from what I remember. Because it's never and explained in the film. In the film, it shows from his point of view as if like he's writing this. You think he's like a diary, but he specifically says letters. Yeah, it is letters, and at the end of the book. I think it's meant to be 10 or 20 years later, he actually goes to the house of the person he sent the letters to. Oh. From what I remember, it's been a while, I might just be getting it confused with a different book, but from what I remember, that is what happens. Yeah, it'd be nice for someone like me who hasn't read the book, it'd be nice if they'd hinted something towards the letters, even if they would change something from the books. Like they could, I thought it might have been something like he's writing these letters to his dead friend. Yeah. You know? Because the dead friend thing is mentioned at the very beginning, and that's pretty much it for the film. It's more prevalent in the book, the dead friend thing, as mm. being, I mean, for example, um, in when they are doing Secret Santa, mm. one of the gifts that he gives Patrick in the book is that he reads a poem that he likes to Patrick. Mm. It's a very dark poem, which you then get explained that the poem was actually the suicide note of his best friend, and he didn't actually know that that was his best friend's suicide note when he'd killed himself. Like Charlie's best friend's suicide mm. note, which um, he uh, Charlie read to Patrick as a poem that he liked. Uh, the poem itself, I will show you quickly. I know it. You know the poem? Yeah. What is the poem? I had a cat named Snowball. She died, she died. Mom said she was sleeping. She lied, she lied. Why oh why is my cat dead? Couldn't that Chrysler hit me instead? <laughs> so, do you want me to read the poem out? Yeah, uh, what, how long is it? It's not that long. It's like medium length. 
Once on a yellow piece of paper with green lines, he wrote a poem and he called it Chops because that was the name of his dog and that's what it was all about and his teacher gave him an A and a gold star and his mother hung it on the kitchen door and read it to his aunts. That was the year Father Tracy took all the kids to the zoo and he let them sing on the bus and his little sister was born with tiny toenails and no hair and his mother and father kissed a lot and the girl around the corner said from the valentine sign of a row of X's. And, he'd and he had to ask his father what the X's meant and his father always tucked him in bed at night and was always there to do it. Once on a piece of white paper with blue lines, he wrote a poem and he called it Autumn because that was the name of the season and that's what it was all about and his teacher gave him an A and asked him to write more clearly and his mother never hung it on the kitchen door because of its new paint and the kids told him that Father Tracy smoked cigars and left butts on the pews and sometimes they would burn holes. That was the year his sister got glasses with thick lenses and black frames and the girl around the corner laughed. When he asked her to go see Santa Claus, and the kids told him why, his mother and father kissed a lot, and his father never tucked him in bed at night, and his father got mad when he cried for him to do it. Once on a paper of torn, it is, it, don't worry, it's, it's not much longer than this. Once on a paper torn well, from his stopped. notebook, he wrote a poem and he called it Innoc Innocence a Question, because that was the question about this girl, and that's what it was all about. And his professor gave him an A, and a strange steady look, and his mother never hung out on the kitchen door because he never showed her. That was the year that Father Tracy died and he forgot how the end of the Apostles' Creed went. And he caught his sister making out on the back porch and his mother and father never kissed or even talked. And the girl around the corner wore too much makeup that made him cough when he kissed her. But he kissed her anyway because that was the thing to do. And at 3am he tucked himself into bed, his father snoring soundly. That's why in the back of a brown paper bag he tried another poem and he called it absolutely nothing because that's what it was all about and he, gave, and he gave himself an A and a slash on each damned wrist and he hung it on the bathroom door because this time he didn't think he could reach the kitchen. That's the poem. It doesn't rhyme. Not all poems have to rhyme. A good it's one a very though. dark poem though. I know, it's very long it, as well. It, anyway, in the book it's, it is a bit... It's a good poem, mm. but then oh, obviously Patrick and everyone else is like, that's the suicide letter of that kid that killed himself, which is Charlie's best friend. So, so it was made up for the film? It wasn't made, that poem wasn't in the film. Oh. Sorry. That poem was in the book, otherwise... Yeah, that's what I mean. Was it made up for the book? Yes. And um, it wasn't, but it wasn't in the film. They didn't actually linger on that too much, which I think is fair enough, because I think the film would have been so much heavier if they followed more of the themes from the book. Within the book, for example, his sister, she always talks about how her boyfriend isn't man enough a okay. lot. And then like yeah. she's like wanting to kind of break up with him and then it gets to the point where he slaps her in the film. Yeah. And she's kind of she kind of ends up becoming really dependent on him at that point. Mm. And even though she knows it's abusive, she becomes more dependent on him. And obviously, it, he just continues to obviously be abusive, but that's not really shown in the book, but you can kind of gather it. And she obviously gets pregnant, and Charlie drives her to the abortion centre mm. to get the abortion. Which, their relationship in the book's a lot closer than it is in the film. Yeah, but I mean, they did shoot the him taking her to the abortion clinic, and they just removed it from the film. Yeah, which... Again, I think it's to basically further the fact that even though he has family that does love him, mm. he still feels alone. Although they do drift apart in the book a bit because what happens, she um, she trusts him with that information, like about the boyfriend hitting her. And he confides in his teacher, Mr. Anderson, and then also his parents. And they obviously confront her and she feels betrayed by Charlie. And because of that, she, um, that, yeah, she doesn't talk to him as much. Did you know this was actually originally going to be made? Uh, the book was going to be made by John Hughes. Oh, really? He was set to write and direct it. He hadn't done much of that, but he really liked the book and wanted to make it. It was like one of it's his old films. John Hughes. It even sense. it even cast the film as well. Yeah, it was going to have Shia LaBeouf. Kirsten Dunst and Patrick Fugit as the main three. Mm -hmm. And the only reason he didn't make it is because he died. It was sudden death. 
because you know it wasn't a long illness so he's thinking oh good this it inspired him to make films again and you could see the film you think he would have made it slightly different he was going to make it like a dark comedy but it would still have been yeah. good john hughes something i found quite interesting so obviously you mentioned before how stephen jaboski was quite inspired by mm. uh, the dead poet society and i don't know if you've picked up on it but in his teacher's last name's anderson Oh, right. Um, which, obviously, there is the character of Todd Anderson within the Dead Poets Society. And a lot of people uh, like to say as if that's that character grown up and he's become an English teacher, which, based on the Dead Poets Society, that's not... Yeah, that could be that could be the case. Especially as where he's quite a nurturing teacher within the film mm. and he's there for Charlie a lot and he encourages him. It's similar to how... Um, Robin Williams. Yeah, Robin Williams is an encouraging character within the Dead Poets Society you've took from. Mm -hmm. But that's, no, I've always found that quite interesting. You know their dance routine, their, their living room dance routine that they do? Yes. That's uh, the same routine that uh, Ross and Monica do. Is it? At the New Year's oh, Eve Oh, that's thing. why it's called the living room routine. Because that's yeah. the same as the one that... Yeah, what they done when they was younger. Yeah. Oh. So maybe that's Ross... And Monica, when they were younger. No, because Monica was fat. Yeah, I suppose. Within the book, Charlie actually goes round to Mr. Anderson's house at one point uh, and meets his wife oh, okay. as well. Which, again, um, in the film, it, a lot of people seem to think that their relationship's a lot closer in the film, but I'd argue it's closer in the book. Because obviously inviting a student over to your house, which could seem a bit wrong, is obviously not in that context. Yeah. But it's obviously, they're obviously a lot closer in the book, whereas at the end of the film, when Charlie hugged him, he seemed really uncomfortable when he hugged him. Yeah. Which I get that's probably normal if you're a teacher, but like he seemed so uncomfortable, it's like as if their relationship wasn't as it was. No, I think it was just literally like he was surprised by the hug. He likes Charlie, but he's just thinking, oh, okay, well, you know, can't really be hugging students. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also in the book as well, Charlie's father, um, there's a whole bit where they talk about an episode of M.A.S.H. Where his, it made his father cry in the book. Do you know what episode? No. Was it the episode where the baby is killed? In, I don't know, it might be, but there's an episode of M.A.S.H. where his father cries in the book. Like he goes to the kitchen and cries by himself and Charlie finds his father crying. He's like, oh, don't tell anyone about this, like about him crying. And it ends up coming up a bit when they and his his father and him are a lot closer in the book. Mm. I also don't remember it being um, as central around their religion in the book than it, as it was in the film, because obviously they go to mass and there is a few bits where it touches on Christianity, which and the same grace at the table. Which but I that, don't that's that's a lot more common in America though. Yeah. Often people like religion isn't as sort of I wouldn't say. Uh, outdated but it's it's definitely more prevalent in american households saying grace at a table is quite commonplace even amongst people who aren't that religious and going to church it's like oh well we've got to go to church it's on a it's sunday let's go to church on a sunday even if they don't want to they go there under duress just because it's like well that's what you're supposed to do which it used to be a lot like that in this country i mean never the grace thing but i remember as a kid going to church but as an adult not really no. Um, I've, we took you there a couple of times, but all steam started coming out of you as we walked it through the door. So we thought we'd better not, and the priest cast you out. So we yeah. thought we'd better not go there again. In the book as well, another difference, which I'm sure you know because you've read it, <laughs> is he. there isn't a second suicide attempt, or there isn't, sorry, there isn't a suicide attempt at the end with Charlie, it's actually, he becomes um, catatonic and doesn't speak much and his parents eventually take him to the hospital. And that's when he sort of realizes what happened with his aunt and that all comes out then. I feel like I might be misremembering it because I do remember there being somewhat of a suicide attempt or at least it's inferred. Right. Like, but I think the catatonic bit is accurate as well, actually, I remember. I, I don't know if I'm just, it's just because I've just watched the film and I'm getting it confused with the book. Mm. But What's better, the book or the film? I like both of them. I, I, I like, if I have to choose, I'd probably say the book. I enjoyed, I really enjoyed reading the book. I really we'll go do a book podcast. 
Oh, sorry. Film! Film! No. Don't shout. You shout. I said don't shout. Can I use your phone? It's quite funny in the way I was just thinking about the John Hughes one where they it cast Shia LaBeouf. I assume as Charlie, but still Shia LaBeouf, who is also an actor who's... Do it! quite controversial some of the stuff that he's got up to in his real in his everyday Personal life. life apparently like fighting people in in bars and getting beaten up this film got 7.9 on imdb hmm. that's quite that's very high that is actually high but i i think it's worthy of that rating mm. I don't, it's not a bad film i really like this film a lot mm. but um what do you do you think it should have been that high or do you agree oh no, I say that's 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 fair. As I said, I mean it's it's not made for me or my generation. No. And I, it's got a lot because of the amount of films I've seen. It's got a lot of other teen films to compete with. But as I said, I was happy to when you suggested it. I ha was happy to watch it again. Well, I think it's a, I I really like the film. So. Well, on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics gave it eighty five percent. And the audience, 89%. So it's pretty even as well, again. Well, that's even, in a way, that's even higher than its rating on IMDb. Because it's yeah. like the eights rather than the sevens. I know, I genuinely, I do, I think that this is a very good film. I don't always say that about films that were made in recent years, but I like that film a lot. Mm. And the budget, it cost $13 million to make. Oof. And it's it may, bad, it's, it's still quite pricey for what it is. I'm surprised it was that much. I would have thought, because even with Emma Watson, who's probably the biggest name at the time, you wouldn't have thought she would have cost that much. Yeah, but they also had Paul Rudd as well. Yeah, but Paul Rudd, you know, you can get him quite cheap if you know the right people. Um, and it made 33.3 million in the box so office. That's good, doubled. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's okay. For the kind of film it is, it's not a bad return. It, it's so, it seems like it's trying to be quite indie. Do you like my Ezra Miller costume? Yeah, sure. This is the kind of stuff he wears. Wears? Wears. He wears. He yeah. wears in. That's why he smells. Um, um, no, I like this. Since it's, it's a fair substitute for my Rocky Horror thing. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's a good suggestion. So thank you, Lily. No worries. Uh, what film are you doing next week with well, Ben? Have you seen The Substance? I have not seen The Substance. Why not? Oh, I just haven't. You should watch The Substance. Should we? Mm, because me and Ben's going to talk about it next week. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Yes, thank you. Uh, make sure to follow, subscribe, like, comment, yeah. share. I kind of blend in with the background of this as well, don't I? Look, let me try and hide in the wall. <laughs> I told you I'd blend in. <laughs> you weirdo. Alright, bye. Bye. Bye bye. It's the perks of being a wallflower, you see, you can be invisible. <laughs>